Welcome to Eternity Now's Worship and Weekly Message, Drawing Near to God and Avoiding Antichrist. I'm Senior Pastor and Evangelist Kyle Huckins. Eternity Now is an evangelism outreach and church based in Scottsbluff, Nebraska, USA, and touching the world, 140 countries so far. You can view our weekly message live Saturdays, 5 p.m. Mountain, wherever you're seeing this. Our Revelation Bible study is Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Mountain, same pages and platforms. Our main website is EternityNow.com. There you can see links to all our preaching and teaching videos, podcasts, doctrine, background, articles, and more. Well, every day seems to bring to light new evidence the present age is ending. But the apostle who told us about the end times has some good thoughts about how to deal with our era and its emerging antichrist. John, who also wrote Revelation, simply and astutely relays this information in 1 John 2, verses 1 to 29, which I discuss in my message, Drawing Near to God and Avoiding Antichrist. Let's now go to our God in prayer. Well, Father God, I thank you so much for this chance to preach your word. I need your help to be able to relay it to the people the way you want. Oh, Lord God, use me. And I pray, Lord God, use the Holy Ghost to apply this word to each heart as he or she needs. Oh, Lord God, we thank you that we can still preach and teach the Word of God without exclusion in America. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, today marks 21 years since I was ordained by a one-time Southern Baptist mission on a closed air base. Back in that day, I never imagined I'd be preaching to you on the end times, all signs fulfilled for the rapture of the church, Antichrist waiting in the wings to pounce on the world. Yet here we are. My three weeks of years in formal ministry have seen many young people come to Christ, many middle-aged, many elderly too, married, single, straight, men, women, LGBT, without endorsing the last lifestyles. I've baptized, buried, and helped folks get married too. <laughs> I've also dodged a good number of brickbats thrown at me, been lied about, and endured much hardship. Much as Jesus told the apostles in Matthew 10, 23, when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly, I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. I've been through a number of towns, but there are still some yet ripe for ministering before I go up to meet Christ. The Apostle John was perhaps in his late 70s when he wrote his first epistle, which came after his gospel. He was a veteran of pogroms and persecutions, yet a strong pillar of the church. We start with the first two verses of 1 John 2. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. John begins by addressing his readers as technion, or much-loved little darlings, appropriate for the apostle emphasizing in his writings love perhaps more than any other. From the beginning of this chapter, John stresses relationship. Sin hurts our connection with God. Yet should we fall into temptation, we can be forgiven due to Jesus' sacrifice of his life and his intercession for us. The apostle adds that not only does Christ's death, burial, and resurrection wipe away our misdeeds in God's mind, such forgiveness is available to every person. 1 John 2, verses 3 through 6. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. John talks about how Christ provides forgiveness for our sins, but he now turns around and says, if we truly love our Lord, then we do not sin. We keep his commandments. Ah, but the apostle is not contradicting himself. The Greek here for keep is tereo, which means to guard or watch. John says that we're to be careful to guard our hearts so that we don't fall into sin, though inevitably we're going to offend the Lord at some point. The more we do what God says, the more greatly we've drawn closer to him, and the more like Christ we are. John says we ought to walk just as Jesus walked, which strikes down easy believism so popular today. The notion it doesn't matter if we sin. Think of it this way. If your mother is like those in my neighborhood growing up, she'd call her kids to come home for dinner or say, be back by a certain time. And if we were late, we'd never say, I don't care. Stop telling me when to come home. 
Rather, we'd apologize and offer an excuse. Oh, I, I didn't realize what time it was. That's because of our relationship with mom. When we value someone, we don't state their word means nothing to us. We apologize. So it is with our Lord Jesus Christ and his Holy Father. We take a look at 1 John 2, verses 7 to 11. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you? Because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So what about this old and new commandment? Well, Christ tells us in Matthew 22, 37 to 39, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Then in John 14, 15 and elsewhere, Jesus brings these two together saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. That is, you show me love when you obey me and respect others. The Apostle John in this paragraph uses the Greek adelphos for brother, which is someone related by faith, not blood. John wrote this epistle to help root out false teachers coming into churches and saying Jesus had never lived as a flesh and blood person. The wolves in sheep's clothing were dividing badly the young congregations. The Apostle asserts that true brothers and sisters of the Lord will love one another, showing patience kindness, and right conduct toward other believers, whether they agree with them or not on a particular question. We go to 1 John 2, verses 12 to 14. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you've known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you've overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you've known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you've known him who is from the beginning. I've written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you've overcome the wicked one. This section is in the form of a poem. It addresses people based on their time of the Lord and grasp of his word. Little children here is not the same Greek term as in verse 1. It is pahedion, or a person only a few years old and under training. John writes, they know the Father and have their sins forgiven, the most basic elements of our faith. Young men is naunaskos, or a teen or young adult, literally an attendant, or someone who's an assistant to those of senior status. The young men in Christ have overcome the devil, are strong in the Lord, and remaining in his holy word. Finally, fathers, or patir, are seniors, elders, people who are teaching and leading others. They've known the Father, developing an intimate knowledge of God from experience and testing. The church today needs all three of these. A problem we have is that, like the world, congregations too often cater to children rather than teach them, entertain young adults instead of challenge them, or put them over the seniors. Our schools and government are falling apart due to this. In our churches, we need to listen to elders, those who have sense and know our Lord intimately. 1 John 2, 15-17 Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father isn't in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Our culture today is dominated by sin. Lust of the flesh, that is, sex. Lust of the eyes, or greed, and the pride of life. Desire for control, and its resultant arrogance. Too many pastors and congregations are compromising with the world to try to win it, which never works. We shouldn't put up unnecessary barriers to others, such as having to wear a suit to services, but we must stand by the Bible and its teachings, which are becoming increasingly unpopular, even in the sanctuary. So why is Scripture so out of favor with our society? Well, because it tries to keep the world from self-destruction, which is the devil's desire for it. A person who's unsaved will ultimately destroy himself or herself, as the devil's destroying himself. In this passage, it could be from sexually transmitted diseases, thievery, or war. Our society is promoting all of these, whether it knows it or not. And indeed, Revelation 9 
says that all of those will be rampant during the soon coming seven year tribulation. We go to 1 John 2, verses 18 to 23. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing for the Holy One, and you know all things. I have it written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. The Apostle tells us here, as he does elsewhere in Scripture, that there is both a specific person who is the Antichrist and those having a spirit of Antichrist. The Antichrist is the man of sin described in Daniel 7 and Revelation 13. The latter also written by John, and Antichrist will demand worship as God and make all take his mark to buy and sell. The spirit of Antichrist indwells those who deny that Jesus is the Christ and don't accept the fatherhood of God. One of my favorite verses in Scripture is here, the 19th, saying, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were with us. Not only is it poetic, it's thoroughly logical as well as succinct. John says, if you see people fall away from a church that teaches and practices the Bible, know that those who depart are not of God, or they would have stayed. They left because they don't agree with Scripture. The Lord allowed it, so others wouldn't think that those falling away are of Him. I think here of the United Methodist Church, which is now very much disunited. Those in it who have respected the Bible's teachings on marriage, the pastorate, and LGBT lifestyles, won the vote at the denomination's global annual conference. However, those who support those unbiblical lifestyles couldn't bear it, so they separated from the ones in the truth. In fact, they invited those who won the vote to leave. The result is several Methodist denominations today, including the UMC, badly decimated. Some of those groups are very biblical, like the Global Methodist Church, while others are woefully devoted to the spirit of Antichrist, including drag shows and services. I wish I were kidding. I am a great admirer of John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. Here is a man who rode a quarter million miles on horseback to spread the gospel. That's ten times around the world. He preached on church steps and in graveyards when his opponents wouldn't let him inside the sanctuary. And he had a single rumpled set of preaching clothes at any one time in his several decades of ministry. I'm more like him than I thought. He didn't marry until age 61, but even then, his wife complained because he was never at home. In all of this folder, all the United Methodist Church has made of his fine work and legacy. First John 2, 24 to 27. Therefore, let that abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he's promised us, eternal life. These things I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you've received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things that is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Oh, what a wonderful positive word for our church today. Once we hear the gospel, spiritual warfare isn't over. In fact, it's only just begun. Recall Matthew 13, Jesus' parable of the soils. In that, the seed is the word of God. Some falls by the wayside and takes no root. But other seed goes on rocky soil. It sprouts up, but it doesn't have depth to survive persecution. Still other seed falls upon thorny ground and is choked out by desires for lust, power, and control. 
The fourth type of soil is the good ground, the saved. And when the seed takes root there, it springs up 30, 60, and 100 fold. People purporting to be Christians may say the Bible has errors and all faiths lead to the same God, that the Lord can't be against any type of love, read sex, but you have not heard so from the beginning. God is not the author of confusion, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 14.33. Our Lord is not going to abandon the scripture at the end of the age, just as he won't desert those who trust in him. Almighty God will not toss away holiness to placate those who shake their fist at him. He also won't give anyone a revelation that contradicts his word, established forever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, Christ says in John 3, 16. All this is true love, to give that which is most precious to save those who are otherwise helpless. It's divine, not human, but in Jesus, the spiritual and physical come together. And everyone who's bowed in this life to him as Lord and Savior has the love of Christ in him. And his flesh is going to be raised up to heaven on that last day. And let's go ahead and finish up our focus passage 1 John 2, 28-29. Now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Oh, my friend, those of us who are ordained get a target on our back to go with a reverend before our names. The devil's gone after me hard. Life's often been difficult. I'm yet hardly perfect, even since knowing Christ, I've overcome many toils and snares. Uh, at the same time, I have no fear of meeting my Lord Jesus in the air or after death. I know him, and he knows me. My sins he's cast as far as east is from west. The fruit he's going in me, he's celebrated and remembered, and it's going to remain. Oh, friend, whether you are a church leader or not, whatever your story, ask God to make you more like Jesus. He's righteous, and that prayer will make you more righteous, if not perfect, for God will answer it. And, oh, friend, it is enough. As our brother John writes in the very next chapter, we know that when Christ is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We will have his spirit, and his grace is going to close any gap there might be in our flesh. <laughs> be encouraged today, and oh, Lord Jesus, he's coming soon, church. He's coming soon. We have seven takeaways today, main points I want you to think about, pray about, and put into practice. Number one, God both forgives our sins and expects us to try to keep his commandments. God both forgives our sins and expects us to try to keep his commandments. John here is quite clear that the believer does sin after coming to faith, and those wrongs are wiped from our record with the Lord as we repent. Ah, but at the same time, he's equally clear that we're to guard our hearts and attempt to walk as Jesus walked. Think of it this way. A father's teaching his little boy how to ride a bicycle. The child gets on the bike, but he doesn't want to push down on the pedals with his feet. His father tells him, if you want to get anywhere, then you have to push down on the pedals. The child says, it's hard. I don't want to. The dad replies, I know, but you won't be able to ride your bike unless you do it. The boy says, can I just rock back and forth and go forward? Dad answers, no. Finally, the boy puts his feet on the pedals, pushes down, and moves forward. This is God as father, us as boy. We want something easy, but the Lord says, Oh, friend, you need to do it my way. We should just do it, but we resist, which is sinful. Finally, we do what he wants. The sin's gone, and we go forward. However, if we never do as God says, we stay in that same rebellion. Number two, Jesus saying, if you love me, keep my commandments, means you show me love when you obey me and respect others. Jesus saying, if you love me, keep my commandments, means you show me love when you obey me and respect others. This combines what John says are the old and new commandments given by Christ. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor. As yourself. The false teachers in John's time had no respect for the Father's sacrifice of his Son, who became sin for us on the cross. Those old evil ones said that Jesus wasn't physical, only spiritual. Those wolves in sheep's clothing divided the flock to profit themselves. Stay away from those who cause schism in God's house. They neither keep the Lord's commandments nor respect him or other people. 
Number three, not everyone in a congregation is at the same place in the Lord. Some are babes in Christ, others growing, learning, and assisting, and still others ruling and teaching. Not everyone in a congregation is at the same place in the Lord. Some are babes in Christ, others growing, learning, and assisting, still others ruling and teaching. John calls the new believers little children, those a bit further along, young men, and the most advanced, the fathers. Too many churches today are listening to the first two groups and ignoring the third. However, study, experience, and maturity are vital to Christian leadership. Number four, our culture and church today increasingly are dominated by sin. Lust of the flesh, that is sex. Lust of the eyes, or greed. And the pride of life, control and arrogance. Our culture and church today increasingly are dominated by sin. Lust of the flesh, that is sex. Lust of the eyes, or greed. And pride of life, control and arrogance. The world embraces sexual perversion and promiscuity, while the church says nothing about members living together but not married, or winks at LGBT lifestyles in its midst. The world thinks it should have what others do, but without working for it. The church preaches about how we can have our best life now, instead of ways to glorify Christ. The world flouts the Bible, Constitution, wedding vows, anything so it can do whatever it wants, whatever it wants, however it wants. The church has pastors and lay members struggling for dominance, with laity ignoring Scripture's emphasis on pastoral leadership, and pastors ignoring laity's gifts and talents. John tells us there is both a specific person who is the Antichrist and people who have a spirit of Antichrist. John tells us there is both a specific person who is the Antichrist and people who have a spirit of Antichrist. The Antichrist is the man of sin of the end times, who will demand worship as God on pain of death, and they all take his mark in order to buy and sell. The spirit of Antichrist indwells those who deny that Jesus is the Christ or Messiah and don't accept the fatherhood of God. Eventually, the Antichrist will unite all those with the spirit of Antichrist, whether they be of a particular world religion or not, and all will go to hell forever. You can read about that in Revelation 17. Number six, if we see people fall away from a church that teaches and practices the Bible, we know that those who depart aren't of God, or they would have stayed. We must not be led astray by them. If we see people fall away from a church that teaches and practices the Bible, we know that those who depart are not of God, or they would have stayed. We must not be led astray by them. Think how John Wesley sacrificed so much of his life to spread the gospel, denying self, picking up Jesus' cross daily, and how the United Methodist Church has become one of the most self-indulgent, adulterous denominations of all time. The UMC has left God, and also Mr. Wesley. And number seven, should we be seeking the Lord but fall short, disappointed we still struggle with sin, we need to know our relationship with God will save us, not our performance. Should we be seeking the Lord but fall short, disappointed we still struggle with sin, we need to know our relationship with God will save us, not our performance. John writes in the very next chapter, 1 John 3, we know that when Christ is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We'll have his spirit, and his grace will close any gap in our flesh. I recall a few years ago, I was driving back home after Christmas. And as I heard God's voice to stop working, even though I was doing something for ministry, he gave me the most tremendous peace I've ever felt in my life. I literally could not worry. It was a quiet but strong feeling and filling of the Holy Spirit. I think it's one of the powers of the age to come mentioned in Hebrews 6. I wasn't sinless. I was still on earth. I yet had problems and issues. But because I was God's, he gave me a supernatural peace. I believe that is what the Lord will do when we're caught up to heaven. Make his down payment of the Holy Ghost into a filling we never thought possible. Oh, it's the gift of God. I want to ask you, in what do you find your peace today? In your job, your money, your family, your friends? Great that you have those, but none of them will get you to heaven. Neither you nor I can earn our way to eternal life. All we can do is realize we can't save ourselves, that the creator of the universe, Almighty God, is the only one who can, then surrender to him. And I'm going to give you a chance to wave the white flag to Jesus so he can save you and make your life complete and everlasting in him. There are four essentials to salvation. Number one, repent of sin and ask God's forgiveness. He will grant it for Christ's sake. 
Confess faith in Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. No way to the Father, but by Him. Believe that Christ rose in body and spirit that third day for our spirit and body must be resurrected too. And follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. You'll do it imperfectly just as I do, but He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's go to our God in prayer. And if you believe what I'm saying, repeat after me. And this will become your prayer of faith and forgiveness. And God will put you into his kingdom. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, I repent of my sins. Please forgive me. I confess faith in Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way to you but by him. I believe he rose on the third day in the tomb in both body and spirit. And I will follow him as Lord and Savior, repenting should I fall. Come into my heart, Lord God, and save me. In Jesus' name, amen. So be it. And my friend, it is. Is. Oh, how wonderful to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. And that is what you have done today. If you've prayed that for the first time or prayed it as a recommitment to our Lord being away from him for a while. Now, once we're saved, what do we do? Well, first of all, we get baptized. It is a sign that we have decided to follow Jesus. Incontrovertible. It is a decision that we have made to receive his grace. We read the Bible. We find out about all those 7,500 promises to us by going through its pages. And we receive those promises by praying to Almighty God by ourselves if we're alone, with others if we're with them. And we can always be with people coming to church, wherever two or more are gathered in our Lord's name. There he is in the midst of us, like we are here online at 5 p.m. Mountain Time on Saturdays and with a Revelation Bible study, 7 p.m. Mountain on Wednesdays. Fellowship with other believers. Spend some time over coffee, coke, whatever it happens to be, and get to know other people who know Christ. It's the beginning of a relationship forever. And also pursue personal relationship with Almighty God. Oh, he knows all about you, friend. Every cell, every thought, every action, every word. And he still loves you and me. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? But you see, he's God. He's love. He's perfect. My friend, remember that Eternity Now is the Evangelism Outreach and Church headquartered in Scottsbluff, Nebraska, USA, and touching the world. Head to eternitynow.com, E-T-E-R-N-I-T-Y-N-O-W dot C-O-M to see our statement of faith, ministry news, end of days, timeline, videos, podcasts, much more. You can see the weekly message Saturdays, 5 p.m. Mountain Live, Facebook.com slash Eternity Now Media, YouTube.com slash at Eternity Now, Twitter's at Kyle Huckins or LinkedIn as well. Revelation Bible Study, Wednesday at 7 p.m. Mountain, same pages and platforms. Our group is just over three years old, and we have reached two million for Christ in that time. We want to reach another one million this year, reach a million more in 24, but we need your help. $25 a month reaches 10,000 for Christ in a year. Go to eternitynow.com, E-T-E-R-N-I-T-Y-N-O-W dot C-O-M. Click support us to see more and give securely, or just go directly to our official secure PayPal page, bit.ly slash reach a million, bit.ly, bit.ly slash reach a million, all one word. Let's go to our Father in prayer now. Oh, Father God, thank you for this time together. Thank you that you forgive us our sins. Thank you that you give us the power to rise above them. Thank you, Lord God, that we can spread this gospel of the kingdom. Oh, Lord God, that we spread this gospel of the kingdom and that, Lord God, people can yet be saved. We pray for every life possible before the tribulation and then every life in the tribulation possible. We pray for God's wisdom and conviction for our country's leaders, protection for every born-again child of God, love, power, and sound mind of the church, openness to Jesus for every non-believer, healing for Toma, financial blessing to Rajat, healing to Hazen, and Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come quickly in Christ's holy name. We pray it. Amen and amen and amen. Well, thank you for being with us today. Contact me directly at khuckins at eternitynow.com, K-H-U-C-K-I-N-S at E-T-E-R-N-I-T-Y-N-O-W dot C-O-M, or 806-463-8793. May the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, and give you peace. <laughs>